disagree with in some ways in ideology, but I don't disagree because they're about our liberation. They are about our people. They're about our people more so than I got to deal with a lot of white anarchists who got a problem with my nationalism. Mm. You know, I'm about my people, number one, foremost. I don't trust no one else to be our allies unless you prove it. You prove it. But the Black Panther Party did even around solidarity, they set some great examples. But we're not perfect. But I'm to this day proud, proud to say that I was a Panther. And at one point, even a soldier in the Black Liberation Army, proud of to this day. And never say, I'm not going to pick up a gun again. Never say, I ain't going back on the ground because my people ain't free. And madmen, psychopaths are still in power. So what are we going to do? Yeah. On my way over here, I got a phone call from a buddy of mine who had just received a DVD. It's called like 586 Attempts on the Cuban Revolution on Fidel Castro. And I actually want to get a copy and I'll make it available to you. But what blows my mind is that Cuba, a little tiny rock, little island off the coast of Florida, you can actually stand in Key West, Florida and see Cuba. That's how close it is to the greatest, largest, meanest, imperialist power in the world has sustained you know, 12 U.S. presidents, every U.S. president have committed themselves, especially to the Florida bloc, but committed themselves to smashing this communist country off the coast of Florida. And they have failed. FBI, CIA, over 186 U.S. intelligence agencies, together with the British and Israeli and the French. We can go every capitalist, imperialist country in the world has attempted to overthrow the Cuban Revolution and have failed. So for me, the demise of the Black Panther Party was not because of the FBI or CIA. If the FBI and CIA was that strong, there would not have been a Vietnamese revolution, a North Korean revolution, a Cuban revolution, the liberation of you know, Ghana, Guinea, Mali, the Congo. They, they would not have occurred. The critical question for me, and this is, I'm going to start with the negative and the positive, is a question, and he might not like the word ideology, but I don't use ideology in a, in a Marxist, Leninist sort of way, nor do I deal with political parties in a vanguard party sort of way. Many of us have studied the revolutions in Guinea, for instance, in Ghana, and talk about mass party, everybody automatically is a member of the party. In fact, if you study Cuba carefully, the Cuban Communist Party does not run Cuba. They have a mass democratic process. And August, a cat named August, and I have the DVD and I played it on the radio, I'll do it again, talks about the mass character of the Cuban Revolution. Because if Cuba was an elite society, okay, an elitist run by a Cuban Communist Party, which only four or five percent of the members of the party, the CIA and all these intelligence agencies would have successfully have overthrown the Cuban Revolution. Because everything from the voice of uh, uh, Marti to literally billions of dollars being funneled in to finance counter-revolution, chemical warfare, swine flu, poison cigars. They even had some shaving cream they tried to get Rafido's beard. They put the shaving cream on. I mean, uh, 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 the cream on his face, his beard would fall off because the U.S. CIA thought that without the beard, he would lose his charisma and people would hate Fidel Castro. That's how stupid they are. So, I mean, it's really ridiculous. So for me, the central question is ideological. My problem with the Black Panther Party, I joined a party in San Diego as a young college kid because of revolutionary black nationalism. That's why I joined. I honestly believe that whether it's Bob Brown in Chicago, we can go across the country, David Brothers, whatever, a lot of us join because of revolutionary black nationalism, because at that time there's a thing called cultural nationalism, or what we call petty bourgeois pork chop nationalism. And those are the two strains within the movement, for the most part, that came post Nick, post the civil rights era. None of us was involved, a lot of us who were serious didn't want to get involved with this cultural bourgeois pork chop nationalism fronted off by us organization, or that network, that tendency with the East Coast with Haki or Barack or whatever, in Newark, we can go around the country. I joined because of revolutionary black nationalism. But all of a sudden, like the brother so eloquently said, you know, every year the ideology change. You know, following year, Marxist-Leninism. Following year, Mao Zedong thought. Following year, Trotsky's. I remember going to the 1970 National Black Panther Party convention at that convention, which got Howard University closed us down, so we had to meet, you know, at an All Souls Church in a big rally in Malcolm X Park, it was told to us our new ideology is intracommunalism. There was this big, and none of us have been educated. What is intracommunalism? What is Trump? We didn't know. We didn't know. At the same time, there was this big coalition formed with the gay community. And all of a sudden, in the middle of Malcolm X Park, you saw 500 gay folks marching in there for this alliance of the party. And all of us were shocked by this because we had never been educated about what is this all about. 
I had to go back in San Diego and report this. They people thought I was making this stuff up. I mean, I got alienated. And I basically said, no, I'm not giving up revolutionary nationalism. And I aligned myself with Kwame Ture, Stokely Carmichael, David Brothers, a whole series of folks. All of a sudden, I became the enemy because Stokely Carmichael was jacking his CIA. So all my comrades, I thought I was the enemy because it's ideological confusion. So my criticism is that ideology must come from the masses, as the brothers said correctly, not from the top down, but from the bottom up. That's why I encourage you in my earlier presentation to study traditional societies, because that's where ideology comes from, humanity. It doesn't come from all a person can do, whether it's Dewey or Karl Marx or Lenin, is observe, analyze from the people and develop theoretical construct that must go back to the people. The essence of democratic centralism is a democracy aspect. The central aspect always goes back to the masses. There's a bourgeois form, as there is with everything, of any theory or ideology, whether it's democratic centralism or socialism, we can look at democratic socialism, and there's a revolutionary aspect. So that's the negative. I can go in more detail, but I want to belabor the point. But critical, and I do believe in ideology because that's what holds us together. I remember the um, Gonzalez, the Attorney General of the United States, when asked, what is the crisis in terms of the United States not being successful in Iraq? He said it's ideological. The Iraqi people, the people of Afghanistan, the people of Somalia, have rejected U.S. ideology. And until the United States can sell the people of Iraq, Afghanistan, Somalia, Sudan, Zimbabwe, American ideology, they will fight and resist to maintain their own indigenous ideology of their particular nation states. Ideology is what the battle is all about, the final analysis. Now, ideology is not just theory. It's theory and practice and historical evolution. The positive aspect, oh my gosh. Number one, within a one-year period, I was arrested 38 times, beaten, unconscious. I, mean, I went through so much trauma at such a young age that now, no matter what comes at me, I ain't worried about it. I have no fear because I survived that. It's kind of like a saying in Trinidad, the rougher the waters, the stronger the swimmer. We were so brutalized. We were so challenged. And it didn't break my spirit that today, challenging like with me and Mike with the crack the CIA coalition or with the riders every time I see them get harassed by people I pull up my car and join with them I have no fear of Zionists I have no fear because I had to face death at a very young age and to make a cold decision am I going to die for my beliefs so it strengthened me and at 59 years old I'm still full of fire still full of fight I don't want to pass a baton on to you all I want to hold the baton with you to burn out this motherfucker because we paid the dues to burn this sucker down we paid some dues um The other aspect of the party was the internationalism. The alliances that were made with the Puerto Rican comrades, the alliances that were made with the Chicano, the alliances made with the American Indian movement, the alliances were made with the Retreat movement in North Africa, the alliances made with the Algerian revolution, the alliances were made with, with the liberation movements throughout the world. The party taught me internationalism. Because sitting in San Diego, all I knew was black and white. We didn't have too many Latinos or Mexicans in those days. And the party taught me internationalism. And the third thing, and it's still alive today, is my comrades. My comrades, because you don't know, brothers here are still involved, sisters here are still involved with struggle, still involved with confronting the enemy. And it's kind of like a fraternity and sorority of us comrades. And we kind of just respect each other. I know that no matter what happens, my back is covered. And wherever I go, whether it's a, a UEP Newton funeral or a reunion meeting or whatever, there's a sense of comradeship because we made history. And most important, the history we made has been duplicated. It's a Black Panther Party of Israel went to Fulasha, the Ethiopian Jews that were brought into Israel who are facing racism. There's a Black Panther Party in India, the Dalit. The largest population of black folks in the world is in India. Y'all call them untouchables. They're dark Indians, black Indians, who because of the racist caste system of Hinduism are brutally oppressed with karma. Generation after generation, they must maintain this lower caste. You can go to Sweden. You know, brothers and sisters in Sweden face racism, have taken the, 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 the spirit of the panther and applied it wherever they are on the run, South Africa. So the, so the legacy of the Black Panther Party, and I disagree to say the party is dead. The spirit still lives on, whether it's Malik Zulu Shabazz, the Black Riders, it's all over the world. So that though physically the old original organization does not exist, the ideological, the spiritual, the militancy, that fire, 
will exist a thousand years from now until we get the goddamn liberation. Because people understand that Black Panther Party represents revolution. The question was positive and critical reflection. Okay, as I told you, uh, when Bunch of L. Prentice Carter, he's a uh, person that started the party in Black Panther, I mean the Black Panther Party here in Los Angeles. And uh, he started a little bit different. We kind of started off as a like a black mile mile. That's what he formed, that's what he organized down here. And that's how the party started. It wasn't until the party started growing that we changed and, and started adopting some of the tactics and, and, and the strategy that uh, was coming from Oakland. So um, I'm gonna give you guys a little bit of education here because there's a lot of talking and stuff. And by me, you know, for whatever reason, uh, getting involved with the party, and the party actually started in like 1967, in about the summer of 67. It became uh, like in the public in like 68 and then the rest of it is history. But, um, so I was there in the beginning, I was in the shootout that Wayne was reflecting to when we had over here on 41st and Central, I was there. And also was with Geronimo Pratt when he got busted, which also led to the, uh, the split of the party, which is what, what, what was, was the demise of the party. And by me being with Geronimo when he got busted, I was privileged to be right in the middle inside of all of what happened with the party. And, and let's, let's put the Black Panther Party in perspective now. U.E.P. Newton and Bobby Seale started the party in 1966. When Huey got busted and went to jail for murdering the police, it might have been 30, 40, 50 people in the Bay Area that was functioning with the Black Panther Party. When U.E.P. Newton got out, there was thousands of people all across the country, all around the world. So what he had started, and, and the picture of Huey in the chair with the shotgun and the spear became a symbol. The free Huey movement became something that rallied the black, white, Chicano, or you know, everybody rallied around that and became a, a, a cause that, that we was able to get him out of jail. The problem arises when the brother got out of jail and, and wanted to take over control because he had no control. He was a spiritual leader. He was a, the leader. We all looked up to him and all the rest of that stuff. But when Huey got out of jail, uh, a couple of weeks later, he changed his name to the Supreme Commander. So now we here, we are the, we the ones that built the party. The, we are the troops that actually built the party and did all the work and, and all of that stuff. So now we read in the paper where Huey now is going to be considered the Supreme Commander. And it's like, whatever, you know, that's, well, I don't know what the trip is, but you know what, there's the police, you know, we got to get on the move. We ain't got time. He can be whatever the hell he want to be right now, but this revolution we got going is in full motion and in full effect. Then two or three weeks later, he was the ultimate high supreme commander. Then a little bit later on, he moved up to the 25th floor. While all of this was going on, we kind of rationalized it all. Well, yeah, he's a leader. Uh, we don't want the police to bust down his door and kill him and all this nonsense and all the rest of this stuff. So what had happened, there was some changes going on where he got out and he was trying to take control of the party. We didn't really know nothing about it. We talk about democratic centralism coming from the top and back up to the bottom and all this stuff. All this stuff came to the forefront basically right around the same time that we got arrested in Texas. And when we was getting arrested in Texas, this is when they're talking about this convention that they had in Philadelphia, this uh, 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 whatever united front against fascism, so on and so forth, where the party went off in all these wild directions and all this kind of stuff. There was a, the party was at a point where the government was coming down so hard. The party was formed on the basis that if we were successful in what we were trying to accomplish, the government would have to come and destroy us. It would have to stamp us out. It was getting to the point where that's what the government was doing. All the officers were getting raided, people were getting killed, people were getting locked up, people were going to jail, and the party was being forced underground. When the party was going to be forced underground, then we was going to go into an underground mode and so on and so forth. We, we talk about Marx and Lenin and all of that. If you involve yourself in a revolution, you have to study revolution. This is why we, you know, Malcolm said that if you're in a hole, it doesn't matter who throw you the rope. And this was the philosophy that we had adopted. We didn't care who or who, whatever, if, you, if we in the hole, you got the rope, we climbing out. We climb out, we are gonna handle our own business. So when we, and, and, and I was with Geronimo, the party sent me down to Texas to meet Geronimo, to be in the underground. I'm gonna make a long story short. We get busted, the next thing you know, we're renegades, we're this, we're that, and so on and so forth. Eldridge gets news from both sides that hey, the things are not going right, plus the people in New York 
uh, was, un was dissatisfied with what Huey was trying to do in Oakland, then you come to this split between Eldridge and Huey, the news media grabs it and makes it like the Black Panther Party split on some kind of ideological ground or that this was happening or that was happening. No, Huey P. Newton destroyed the Black Panther Party. He did it by himself and with the help of David Hilliard. He destroyed the Black Panther Party. True enough, he started it, but he destroyed it. Uh, there was no uh, conversation about it. One day, you was either with Huey or you was not. And that was it, period. And that's the way it broke down. So everybody that would believed in the revolutionary, believed in the struggle, basically faded out the movement, or they went into the BLA, the Black Liberation Army. Uh, the party took over all the money, all the lawyers, all the office. Huey got all of that stuff. If you know anything about the Black Panther Party, you know the, the history. He started into uh, uh, nightclubs and prostituting and killing people and all this nonsense. And then the party just dissipated and died out because the people had lost their faith in the party because the party had been detracted from the direction. Now, Cointel and everybody else all had a part to play in that. But this is really what destroyed the party. So what the brother said about having that high leadership and believing in it, there's a lot of validity to that. Because when we were in the party, the one thing that we never thought would happen, that we would turn on each other. But that is exactly what happened. They were able to pit people against each other, and we ended up against each other. And that really destroyed the party. And, and you know, that was the, the negative thing about it. The positive thing about the party is that it is a part of history that black people stood up, said they were not going to be victims any longer. Black men stood up and said they were not going to be cowards. You understand that we were ex-slaves. And don't ever you forget, we are ex-slaves. I am an ex-slave. I am a victim of America. You know, fuck America, all right? <laughs> fuck America. I'm a victim of America. So don't, get those, don't, don't twist that shit up. And all the good Negroes that want to wave the flag and, and, and push this shit, fine with them. But then at the same time, they are your enemy, believe me, because they are representing the, the most negative fucking shit in the world today. Negativity, the devil, you call it whatever you want. This country, America, this two-faced it, you know, that's going around the world like an octopus, sucking everything out of everything, everybody in the world, you know, and then, and then with this schizophrenic personality, like, you know, it's, 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 that's just what they're supposed to do. You understand? And we were their slaves. They, they treated us like slaves. They lynched us. They burnt us. So when the generation came along where it was time to stand up and confront this tyranny, I am so proud that I was a part of that. And that's the legacy of the Black Panther Party is that, yeah, at some point in time, after 400 years, some black men got some balls and stood up to their slave master and not died, but would kill a motherfucker. <laughs> Fuck that dying shit. Kill a motherfucker. And that's what made us a threat. All right, due to the lack of time, uh, we want to take uh, questions real quick. And we have a mic over here. So if any folks want to ask questions, you can come and line up right here and jump on this mic right here. And uh, I'll give the, give it, before we take questions and answers, get back to Wayne Price real quick. Yeah, I just wanted to reiterate, you know, Roland uh, made, made excellent, excellent uh, uh, observation. And, you know, my take on the whole thing was when Huey came out and said he was supreme commander, I jumped off the Black Panther Party. I was gone. And, and what one has to remember is not to get in the hero worship. If you're a revolutionary and you're moving forward, you know, you have to realize that sometimes the flesh is weak. Anybody ever read the Bible? The flesh is weak. If there's a pile of cocaine down there, I'm going to go toot it. Huh? If it's some rocks right down there, I'm going to go toot it. The flesh is weak. If there's a pretty woman in the back, I'm going back there. I'm going to go back. So when we say ideology, once you, you know, if you, let's digress. If you look at Malcolm X, when Malcolm X saw the contradiction in Elijah Muhammad, and really got to understand the true nature of Islam, he had to jump off. You know, when Huey came out of jail, Roland went up to the Oakland, they had an icebox full of food, they was tooting cocaine. 
He came back and told everybody what was happening. I said, we need to kill him. We need to make a hero out of this guy because, because he's going to fuck up everything, and he did. You know, so, and, and you know, they started a goon squad where they used to go around and beat up people. The guy came to me and he said, Wayne, we want you in the goon squad. I didn't sign up for that. I'm not, I, I signed up for something else. I'm not beating up somebody because they went to sleep on security or pistol hit somebody in the head with a <laughs> stick or something like that. So you know right from wrong, even Geronimo. And, and Roland and myself, Geronimo locked us in the room so we could study, and we were captains in the party. And Geronimo uh, uh, sent a letter from prison one night, and he said, hey, hey uh, he sent some guys by my house. He said, hey, man, uh, we got to go shoot this snitch. And I said, well, what's the plan? After they told me the plan, I said, the plan stinks. You know, so, uh, I had my girl bring out some pistols and shit. I said, if you need some guns, here's some guns, here's some bullets. But I'm not going, because that plan stinks. So you always have your mind. And it's your mind. You get the ideology, but it's your mind. And through discussion, you deal with people, and you work with people, but it's in your mind. Your mind knows right from wrong. You know, like, like when I was a kid, I never broke in nobody's house. I was too scared, because I said, if somebody broke in my house, I'm going to fuck them up. <laughs> so I was too scared to break in somebody's house or snatch a woman's purse. Now, that's petty. Now, I'll go rob a store. I'll do that. You know, I'll take some money. I'll bust you upside your head. I'll do that. But I'm not going to do nothing petty like that. Snatch some woman's purse walk. That's a chump move. That's what chumps do. You know, I'm a plan something. So, you know, it's your mind. We all have minds. So whatever organization that you in, it's the ideology, but don't fall in love with the man. The flesh is weak. You see, you have to be in love with the ideology, political discussion, political thought, you know, and that goes on. That can continue. But when you start putting somebody on a pedestal, you put your, set yourself up for a downfall. So that's one of the criticisms of the Black Panther Party that I have. So do we have any questions? Just grab this mic over here. And if folks want to ask questions, you can line up right here. And just try to make it brief and you know, concise and straight to the point. To bring this up, I thought it might be helpful. We're talking about the, the origins of anarchism, and I, in studying history, I, I, I learned about the Alexandrian period of Greek civilization, and I just wanted to maybe challenge the idea that anarchism is a strictly Western ideology or Western thought that it was formed, you know, partly in Europe, but also partly uh, from a Greek tradition that was that was formed in Alexandria, Egypt, which is a part of Africa, and uh, so I just kind of want to point out that these ideas, these uh, are shared by by a, a wide you know range of people, and their origins come from from you know from all over, including from Africa. So when we talk about anarchism as a Western as a Western thing, I mean there's been all kinds of contributions, including including an African contribution. So I just I just thought that might be helpful to point that out, and I, I learned that from Karis once, by the way. I, I just want to posit that it's not part of the foundation. We're going to ask two more questions after this and then we'll wrap it up. Yeah, I just want to say that thank you for that offering us a piece of the anarchist history. But I would argue that the origins of humankind, it can be verified, you can Google origins of humanity, came from Mother Africa. All human beings, you can do a mitochondrial DNA testing. There's a series of you know, ways you can verify genetically, scientifically, empirically. That's all the source of all the sites you want. That Africa is the origin of humanity for literally millions of years before the development of Greek civilization, before the development of Alexandria. That African people, indigenous people, my Native American brethren and sisters, for 270,000 years before the Europeans came here, were living in non stratified, non hierarchical, complementary Mother Earth. Before they kill a deer, they would pray and ask to use every piece of it. The essential ethics and values of anarchism is founded 
in a non-class stratified society in which you're also had a part in that. But I'm saying the notion of anarchism existing, you know, with the development of the European bourgeois ideological thought, and that being imposed upon us through cultural imperialism tied to British, French, English, German imperialism, that's what we're rejecting. That's what we're rejecting. And we need to come up with a foundation. All right, we're going to take uh, two more questions. So, so uh, I have a question for everyone and would like to answer this in the panel. Um, revolutions that happen in other countries, um, like for example, like if a, like a revolution in, in, uh, in Vietnam happens amongst Vietnamese, everyone who lives there is part or mostly part of the same ethnic group. Um, but uh, the context of the United States is that we are an extremely racialized society. Um, most, uh, uh, yeah, and, and, and most of us are workers. There's, there's an, an elite group of people who, who like manage and own everything. Um, and the way that they use us is they, they divide us by, by, by race a good portion of the time. And some of us are like uh, backup workers. If, if these motherfuckers go on strike, then we're gonna have employ these motherfuckers to break up their strike. And um, there's people who are paid less than other people. Um, <coughs> due, due specifically to the race, and there's certain there's certain jobs that are given to people because of the race, and so um, I was wondering how do we accomplish a revolution in the United States, um, and um, with the, the, for example the Black Panther Party ha having a, a black nationalist um, program, um, how do we envision a revolution happening in the United States? Is it is it, is it specifically going to come from the black community? Is it going to come from everyone participating in it? And if everyone's participating in it, does everyone have to form their own form of, of, of nationalism in order to accomplish that? And if that's so, then how do we, how do we eventually come to a point in which um, we, have, we start having uh, discussions about what do we want to build for all of us, not just what do we want to build for Mexican people, for black people, or you, you guys get the word I'm trying. Um, that's a good question. What I can say to you is that nationalism just gives us a base to organize our communities, you know, but capitalism itself breaches past all races, you know, and in order for us to really establish a revolution in America, it's going to take each individual races to organize their national social consciousness and then us working together to destroy fascism on the, you know, saying a global scale. Now, where you were speaking on it, um, different class bases, I guess, and how different people have job positions that are higher than others. Well, you have to really take a guerrilla warfare type strategy and understand that everybody has a different place in the revolution and that you have to use whatever position you are in society to break down that particular place that you are in society. So if you're a worker, you organize the workers and you break down the capitalist businessmen. If you're a student, you organize the students and you break down the institutionalized racist, you know, the institutionalized racism. And then everybody has their own factions of what we need to do but it's gonna take internal revolution. We can't wait on anybody outside the perimeters of America to help do anything because we're inside the belly of the beast. We're gonna be the ones to create the internal cancer to break this whole overall body down, you know? One of the most dangerous things um, that the Black Panther Party did on, on and other folks, um, Malcolm did it. When Malcolm was um, a kill whitey, white man as a devil kind of guy, um, that was fine. When Malcolm transcended that and started talking about working with all kinds of people, with any kind of people towards a common goal of liberation for all people and it ended this particular type of oppressive society, oh, he got to go. Martin Luther King. Now, when he started talking about, you know, this war thing ain't right, and the workers are getting screwed, it's like, whoa, okay, we got to kill him. The Black Panther Party, with um, its um, rainbow coalition, bringing all kinds of people together, 
regardless of, as I said, of race and creed and all those other things, saying, oh, oh we not buying this nonsense about kill whitey and da 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 da. We are all going to work towards this common goal. So, oh, we got to take them out. Those are the things that have to be done in order to change the face of this nation and this world. Um, this is a present a point of view from the Pan-African movement, okay? I'm not claiming to represent the Black Panther Party in this point of view. Our historical analysis tells us, number one, we've got to have a revolutionary review of the history of the United Snakes of America. That is a settler colony, no different than occupied Palestine, occupied Ireland, or the Americas that are occupied by the Spanish and their descendants today. The United States belongs to Native American people. Fact A. And when we say Native American people, we look at a Zotlan, or what's called Chicano, Mexicano, SA, Mexican American, ain't nothing but confused Native Americans that are focusing on the Spanish aspect and negating their indigenous as well as that African blood that runs strong, in fact, stronger than the Spanish blood in most El Salvadorian, Guatemalan, Mexicans throughout this hemisphere. So this stand belongs to indigenous people. California's part of Mexico. Mexico was stolen by the Spanish from indigenous Aztec, Toltecs, Mayan, Olmec civilizations. So we posit this is a settler colony and that we as Africans acknowledge that. We don't claim United States as our homeland. We claim Africa as our homeland. We were stolen from Africa. We've been brutalized since we've been in the United States and our liberation can only occur with the total liberation of the 53 microstates from neo-colonialism that dominates the Congo, that dominates Somalia, that dominates so many countries in Africa, the liberation from neo-colonialism and imperialism control of those 53 states, the unification of each of those 53 states into one United States or all African Union Socialist government that will provide a national homeland for African people, black people in the diaspora. We need a national homeland as Africans. Native American Chicanos' homeland is America's. We unite, whether it's Alcatraz, the fourth, we call, uh, uh, what y'all call Thanksgiving, we call the National Day of Mourning. For 15 years, we go up to Alcatraz with the elders. You know, I unite with Fidel and DFR for the anti 4th of July. Y'all know what I'm talking about. So we acknowledge that. Number three, in terms of the struggle here, we believe because of the different cultural experience we've had as African and even as Native American Chicanos that our struggle is qualitatively different than European working class struggle. Y'all Europeans don't have identity crisis, don't have self-hate. You turn on TV, radio, schools, books, whatever, all you see is the positive images of your women, of your history, of your culture. It may be class stratified, it definitely is patriarchal, but it doesn't breed self-hate where white people hate themselves because they're white. We've got African people today, and all you got to do is step right out in these streets. You see, a blood or a crip will shoot a, a black person before they even aim a gun at a cop. And studies have been done that when gangsters point their gun to shoot a cop, before they pull a trigger, they have an instinctual response to pull away. The psychological brainwashing, the sublimum, sublime brainwashing of white power is so powerful that we've got to decolonize. So for African people, people of color, our central question must be to develop a revolutionary political movement globally that addresses, that addresses the 500 years of European psychological, cultural, spiritual brainwashing, setting up a colonial mentality, we've got to decolonize our mind. That's why national struggles can be revolutionary or they can be bourgeois. We also believe in alliances. I've worked in alliances in LA with the, with the Crack the CA coalition with a series of things. We don't have no problem with alliances, but we have learned from history that African people must elevate our own organization to show that we too can do run organizations, we too can organize, we can do the kind of things that we see white folks doing all the time. So for us, the question of the liberation of the United Snakes is a question of national liberation of indigenous people and alliance with all progressive people. But what must be posited is that Africa is for the Africans, a home and abroad, 
and Americans for indigenous, Chicano, Mexicano, El Salvadorian, Guatemalan, etc. And Europe for the Europeans, and Europeans in the United States must get involved with the struggle in Greece, must get involved with the revolutionary, anarchistic, and socialist struggles that are occurring in Italy, that are occurring in uh, uh, England. There's st strong movements there, but y'all have no ties to that. Because you control the world. White supremacy controls the world. And if you're serious, Europeans need to also develop strong ties with your ancestral homeland, develop bases so you can bring that energy into the struggle here and vice versa so that we as revolutionaries can operate globally rather than some sort of American-centric worldview and American-centric organizational ideology where somehow or other we think that liberation of America is going to liberate the world. And that's bullshit. That's bullshit. Because imperialism has shown that has a life and it's a death. And we look at the world today with the rise of China, India, the European Union, the Bolarian bloc, the six countries in Latin America that rejected the West, Russia, that the United States no longer is the mono-economic power of the world. It's not the dominant power in the world. It is competing now with five other major power blocks. And the day, the good old days of all them high equities in your SFR, your homes, and so those days are dead. U.S. imperialism is dying. People don't even want the U.S. dollar no more. If you go to Europe, you go to Africa, you got that euro dollar, you got that euro dollar, you know, you got that Japanese currency, the Chinese currency. So once again, my point is that this is a settler colony. We need to recognize and develop those of us who have been victimized by European white supremacy's culture, politics, religion, and spirituality, and we need to form alliances, righteous Europeans, and coalitions, not in the organization, but in coalitions. That's our worldview in this question. That was well said. Uh, I, I'm gonna make a closing statement because, uh, yeah, I'm gonna just make a closing statement. Like, and I'm gonna repeat because I do repeat myself. Like I said, I'm here in the honor of my brother, who was Elder Freeman, who uh, uh, hold you anarchists in high esteem. He really, really likes you guys. I mean, he really do. Now, my view of anarchists, I, I'm pretty good with history, but you know. A guy back in the 20s and 1910 throwing a firebomb and all that, you know, that's, you know, hey, that's all right with me. It's all good with me because I think we all need to be burning this motherfucker down. <laughs> but at the same time, I know it's hard for you to organize when you don't really believe that you should have no central authority or none of that shit. So I, you, you are... You, you in an uphill struggle, and I'm just here to try to inspire you, you know, that we do need to be burning this motherfucker down, but don't start right now when we walk out the door <laughs> because we don't want the library to burn down, and we really don't want to burn down a little neighborhood that we're living in right here, you understand? And it's the same thing. It's like if you're an anarchist and you really don't give a fuck, which I am, but then when I parked, I could have parked in the red, but then if I got a ticket... I, you know, I got to get up tomorrow. I got to, you know, I got to feed my family. I got to continue to live. So you're in a hell of a bind. All of us that think the way we think, we're in a hell of a bind. And I just want to encourage you to don't give up. Don't quit. Just keep, keep at it. Just keep nicking at it. It said that Miles said it's a spark that starts a prairie fire. And one of us got to be that spark to keep this shit going because this shit got to come down. Simple as that. Thank you. And real quick, we have to wrap up. We don't have any more time, but uh, I do want to apologize to, in particular, women of color because they didn't get a chance to come up here and ask any questions or any people of color. But oh, yeah, but still, I want to apologize for that b due to the lack of time. But we're going to close out with uh, Bilal Ali, and you're going to take us out. All right, let's end out on the expression of unity for the act of unity. Can everybody stand up? Not today, because I got something for Anyway, anyway. And our struggle ain't over with the election over Barack Obama, by the way. That's not the end of our struggle. We didn't struggle for a black president in the White House. So fuck Obama and his mama. Anyway, anyway we're going to leave out with this. And this is just to culminate. These are my brothers, man. These are my heroes. These are my heroes. These brothers, when I was going to Man Yards High School and the Black Panther Party came and organized us as the first black student union, and there a lot of them are here, a lot of them are gone. I love them. I love the new ones. So we end on what we've been talking about all night long. All power to the people. All power to the people. All power to the people. All power to all the people. Black power, black people. Black power, black people. Red power.
for red people. Red for red people. Yellow power for yellow people. Brown power for brown people. Brown power for brown people. White, well, your white folks, y'all got enough power. We're going to end it on.